and the honourable member to Regina, Wiscana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to be able to speak this morning to Bill C-32, the Fall Economic Statement Implementation Act. Yeah. Or more specifically, I'll be talking about a very exciting research institution that should have been mentioned in the Fall Economic Statement but wasn't. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, or CIPCERT, is headquartered in my riding at the University of Regina. But before I get into the details of the vitally important work that CIPCERT is doing, I would like to invite my fellow MPs to imagine themselves as witnesses to a number of tragedies that recently occurred across our country. On November 10th, 2021, a cyclist was killed after being run over by a dump truck. He was the fifth cyclist in that city to be killed that year, on top of numerous other car crashes. This happened in Montreal, in the Prime Minister's riding of Papineau. In May of this year, following severe thunder and lightning storms, a 59-year-old man was killed when a tree fell on him. This happened right here in Ottawa, in the official opposition leader's riding of Carleton. In 2018, a driver heading westbound on a highway lost control of her vehicle, veered into the eastbound lanes, and was struck by two other vehicles. The out-of-control driver was killed, and five others were injured, including a young child. This also happened in Montreal, in the Bloc Quebec Wall Leaders' riding of Belloy Chambly. And in May of last year, a 23-year-old man was shot dead in a violent gang attack at a shopping centre that saw two other people wounded and sent patio diners ducking for cover and using tables as shields. That happened in the NDP leader's riding of Burnaby South. And last but not least, Mr. Speaker, there were the horrifying events from the Labor Day long weekend in which an ex-convict armed with a knife went on a stabbing spree in his hometown and a neighbouring community, leaving 10 dead and 18 wounded. I am, of course, speaking of the events at the James Smith Cree Nation and the village of Weldon in my hometown, in my home province of Saskatchewan. Now, Mr. Speaker, I could go on for hours citing tragedies in every single riding in this country from coast to coast to coast. The question, Mr. Speaker, that I would like members of this House to ask themselves is this. If they had witnessed even one of these events, which we all easily could have, how would they be affected? Mr. Speaker, I bet we would all feel stressed out. Many of us would probably have nightmares. Some of us would even come away with a sort of PTSD that we would experience the next time we were driving down a highway or walking through a shopping mall or cycling past a dump truck or maybe even just walking by a tree during bad weather. Keep in mind, Mr. Speaker, that I am speaking of the sorts of psychological scars that we would carry from just one single event. But our frontline public safety workers including police, firefighters, paramedics, soldiers, border services and correctional services, and many others. They face this type of trauma every single day, and often multiple times per day. For our safety and for our well-being, frontline public safety workers not only face daily physical risks, but they also live in a constant state of psychological siege that does not end when they punch the clock at the end of the day. It follows them home, affecting their health, their sleep, their relationships, and more. Several members of this House had the opportunity to meet and talk with the representatives from CIPCERT at their breakfast reception here on Parliament Hill earlier this month. Dr. Nicholas Jones and Dr. Nicholas Carlton, affectionately known as the two Dr. Nicks, brought MPs up to speed on a number of shocking facts about the psychological fallout suffered by public safety workers. For example, studies have shown that fully one quarter of all paramedics have had suicidal thoughts over the course of their careers. And the, the profession has a rate of suicide attempts roughly double that of the general population. The two Dr. Nicks have also told me that a significant part of the problem is the mental health culture within many of these professions. For police, firefighters, soldiers and others, there's often a tough, suck-it-up attitude about mental health that in the long run only serves to make the problem worse. But it can be difficult to break through this frame of mind. After all, the people in these professions are trained to be tough, 
to be authority figures. They are trained to be the people who remain calm and in control when others are panicking. So one can easily imagine how very difficult it must be for these people in these professions to let their guard down, to allow themselves to be vulnerable, and to ask for help when usually they are the ones providing help to others. When speaking about social problems, advocates often like to use the word epidemic to describe them. And this word most certainly applies to the mental health challenges faced by public safety workers. Yet, despite the growing extent of the problem, relatively few public resources have been invested. This is where SIPCERT comes in. Founded in 2018, the Institute was established as a knowledge hub, working in conjunction with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research to investigate the treatment of post-traumatic stress injuries for the country's public safety workers. While SIPCERT may consist of, of a multidisciplinary research team, they do not merely conduct studies and gather reports. Instead, they are actively engaged in developing practical, real-world tools to assist public safety workers. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate that one of the rules of this House is that we are not allowed to use props, because I would love to demonstrate one of the very innovative solutions that SIPCERT has developed. One of these innovations that the two Dr. Nicks demonstrated to me at the University of Regina earlier this year is a daily stress monitoring device and app. Essentially, the public safety worker uses a stress monitoring device once per day. This device collects data about the person's blood pressure, heart rate, and other physiological signs, and the device is sophisticated enough to distinguish between physiological changes brought on by stress and those brought on by, say, going for your morning jog. All of this data is then fed into an app that the public safety worker and his or her therapist can see and monitor over time. If those stress levels are starting to go off the charts, or off the app in this case, then those public safety workers can ask themselves what was happening at those times that triggered that stress. Likewise, the therapist can start to work on intervention strategies to bring down those stress levels before they get to dangerous levels. And Mr. Speaker, SIPCERT has accomplished all of this and more through the frugal use of their initial funding of $5 million, plus a few project-specific grants along the way. But sadly, Mr. Speaker, all of this good work that SIPCERT has done and all of the good work that they could potentially do in the future is in jeopardy. Their initial five-year funding commitment from the federal government expires on March 31st of next year, just four short months from now. No federal funding has been committed after that date. Furthermore, due to the ethical code of conduct to which researchers are bound, they cannot begin research with new subjects unless there is enough time left for the subject to also finish the program. That means SIPCERT will not accept any new public safety workers into their program after Christmas. That's why, Mr. Speaker, I was particularly disappointed that the Finance Minister did not mention this research institution in her 10-minute speech to the House on November 3rd. Nor was there any mention of SIPCERT in the 96-page Fall Economic Statement. Nor was there any mention of it in the 172-page Implementation Act that we are debating this morning. And so, Mr. Speaker, I would like to urge both the government and every member of this House to take a closer look at the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment and the solutions that they can provide to this country's public safety workers and to their mental health challenges. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question Kamal the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And a couple of things come to my mind when the member has made his presentation. Uh, one is the fact that uh, never before have we seen a national government play such a prominent role in terms of mental health, where we have literally allocated millions of dollars, uh, going into hundreds of millions of dollars, towards the issue of mental health. We've reinforced through Veterans Affairs uh, financial support for those individuals 
individuals that need to be able to have uh, that support in that whole uh, area. When it comes to, to research, as a government, I would challenge the member to find another national government in the last 20, 30 years that has invested more money in research in science. And I suspect that there is going to be many uh, universities uh, and other post-secondary facilities that are out there. My question to the member is, is it the, the position of the Conservative Party that the Government of Canada should continue to look at post-secondary uh, facilities and financially support research uh, projects, even if it means having to pay tax dollars? The Honourable Member for Regina, Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, the Honourable Member for his question. So the Conservative Party is in favour of a one-for-one -one policy when it comes to government spending. If for every new dollar of government spending, we should find one dollar of savings somewhere else. And I, I really don't think that is very difficult uh, to do, Mr. Speaker, when one considers the, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank that has cost $30 billion, but has not delivered a single project. When one looks at the ArriveCan app that cost $54 million, I, I'm sure with a little bit of effort, we could find savings elsewhere in government to fund a very worthwhile program like SIPSERT. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You Questions and comments? Question and commentaire. Uh, the Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to investments in mental health, and specifically investments in our first responders, well, this matters greatly to me. When mental health deteriorates, there are always reasons. These reasons could include lack of support. Over the past 30 years, the federal government has not adequately supported mental health. The government needs to look at itself. There have been cuts Everywhere in Canada, all provincial and territorial governments have had to make cuts to ensure that services can be offered. And this affects first responders. And this is because the federal government has not invested enough. So can the colleagues speak to health transfers and the fact that the federal government should handle what's in its jurisdiction, not in provincial and territorial jurisdiction? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Yes, so my view is that uh, it is the role of provincial governments to deliver and implement a lot of these programs, and the, the federal government's focus should be on research into new treatments and new technologies, which can be used uh, across the country and across the world. And that is where I think SIPSERT is in a unique position in that they don't just talk about the problem, they have actually developed solutions and what they're asking for is a, a rather modest uh, funding allocation of, of several million dollars to scale up their research and to make it available across the country to, to benefit first responders and, and to benefit everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Member for his speech. Now, he, he focused a lot on, on rising crime. Uh, and the reality is, uh, I was in this House, as were many of the members, when the former Harper government destroyed the network of national crime prevention centres. Now, Mr. Speaker, that made no sense at all, because as we know, one dollar invested in crime prevention saves six dollars in policing costs and court costs and prison costs. And yet the Harper government reprehensively destroyed absolutely destroyed that national centre, uh, the network of national crime prevention centres that did such good work in preventing crime right across the country. Now, I think the Conservatives would be right to criticize the Liberals for not re-establishing those crime prevention centres, but the reality is Conservatives wear the fact that they destroyed the bulwark against crime in this country. And my question through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member is simply why? Why did the Harper government, why did Conservatives destroy the National Crime Prevention Network that did such great work in preventing crime in our communities? The Honourable Member of Regina, Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for his question, although that is quite a bit beyond the scope of, of my intervention. I mean, uh, there will always be violent crime, uh, sadly enough. There will always be earthquakes. There will always be car crashes. 
and I hope that there will always be first responders there to help people when they are suffering some sort of tragedy or some sort of crisis. And the, the mental health challenges will always be there as long as we have first responders doing their jobs. And it would be nice if we could provide some more support for our first responders, as I outlined in my intervention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, uh, reprise the debat. I have the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General.